Today I'm taking a train, 75 kilometers north of Berlin to the spa town of Furstenberg. A town that has been welcoming German tourists for years, seeking relaxation amongst its three lakes. It's a town with a very dark history. I made it to Fustenburg. Uh, it took about 50 minutes on the train. I tried to read a book and fall asleep. <laughs> feel very really tired today. Hope it's not the corona. Um, right, so the plan is to just uh, have a wander around, see what uh, fustenberg has got to offer. Probably it does attract quite a few tourists. Street food festival signs over there um, but yeah there's a few lakes and it's supposed to be a pretty little town and uh, the first thing I need to do is go, go and find myself a coffee, uh, coffee shop it's nice nice little uh, view of the square for the church there and uh, coffee is good and it only costs 195 so Good choice. Right then, my destination is uh, 26 minutes away by bus or 30 minutes on foot. So uh, I'm going to be walking. Um, but first, I'm going to head behind this netto and I'm going to take a look at the lakes because there's uh, two big lakes just on the other side of here. So I'm going to walk down there and uh, have my breakfast. Oh, it's a very uh, pleasant place. Nice houses overlooking the uh, lake on both sides. There's a lake on, on either side. And I was hoping to find a lovely bench to sit down and enjoy the view over both lakes. I'm not sure that's going to be the case because it looks like this just leads to a bridge. Uh, but we'll have a look. There is a park uh, just to the left. <clears throat> look at these houses though. Tell you what, I think uh, people live well in uh, Furstenberg. Houses are uh, really nice, and all of these uh, will be overlooking the lake as well. So they've got great views on the other side. We've got terraces and balconies. Nice little town, old Furstenberg. So what's made me decide to uh, get on a train and travel 75 kilometers north of Berlin to this small but pleasant spa town? Well, just 20 minutes walk away from the center of the town is a place called Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück was a concentration camp that was built uh, entirely for women. It's hard to believe that the people of this town, after the war, claimed that they uh, were unaware of the atrocities that took place at Ravensbrück. Being as the camp is a 20 minute walk away from the centre of the town, you can actually see it over the uh, lake that I've just been sat next to. Now I don't know much about what went on there, and that's what I'm going to find out. Let's go and uh, delve into this town's dark history. Well, this is the first thing you see to give you some indication of uh, what to expect once you get to the camp. Well, I'm presuming that this is the camp. 
You can still see the old uh, barbed wire. So just over to my right, over here, um, in 1991, there were plans to build a supermarket, believe it or not, and uh, which brought the town to the world's attention uh, because there was a lot of protests going on. Who would build a supermarket on the site of a concentration camp? I've reached what I think is the uh, main entrance point to the camp, but the reception was closed and uh, oh this appears to be accommodation, which I wasn't expecting. So this was uh, the uh, female guards quarters, I'm not sure if they all were, but this says it was one of eight and they all look very similar, so I'm presuming that all of these used to be the, uh, the living quarters for the female guards of the camp. And uh, then they became living quarters for the Soviet army and the CIS army. And now it's the Ravensbrook Youth Meeting Centre and Youth Hostel. Well, nothing appears to be open. <laughs> well, the information place is not open. Um, there's no maps you can pick up. So uh, it does say on the website that it's open today. So that's a bit disappointing. Um, I was hoping to just they'd at least you know leave some maps outside so people can just pick them up and wander around but but no there was a QR code outside uh, for an audio guide but no so the internet and uh, there is Wi-Fi which you can connect to but that doesn't work either So this map shows you um, where the uh, women who were sent to Ravensbrück, where they came from. So you can see you've got 8,000 German women. Um, looks like most of them are from Poland, 36,000, 20,000 from the Soviet Union. Um, interestingly, 38 from Britain and 2 from Ireland. Don't know how they managed to get themselves uh, sent to a concentration camp in northern Germany. So the museum for the camp is housed inside the former SS headquarters, and this is where all the administration for the camp would take place. And in there, you discover um, all the plans and the expansion of the camp and the daily uh, life of the prisoners that were held here. One thing that is apparent is that over the um, years that the camp was in existence, how things got progressively worse. In 1939 the camp was home to just a uh, hundred or so people and uh, by 1944 there was 40,000 people staying here um, and there were 40 satellite camps. There was a camp for the dying where the sick would be uh, moved to just left to die basically. Uh, gas chambers were built. Everything that you hear about um, in other camps such as Auschwitz um, all took place here and in fact many prisoners were moved from Auschwitz to uh, Ravensbrück and were shocked at the way that people were treated. Now how bad must things have been for people to come from Auschwitz and be shocked at the uh, treatment that they received here. Over the years the amount of food that prisoners were given was halved. The barracks became more crowded. Barracks that were built to house 100 prisoners suddenly had 500 people living in them and when prisoners were moved off to other camps as soon as some prisoners left others were arriving. The museum discusses resistance, religion, there's much distrust between various groups of uh, people that were sent to Ravensbrück but also positive relationships too. Friendships. Over 600 children were born in Ravensbrück. This was the main camp gate. So this is the camp's main compound, which initially uh, consisted of just one main street going through the middle and then two rows of huts, which would house about 3,000 prisoners. Um, as the camp was expanded, um, three more streets were put in and uh, made up of five rows of huts. 
canteen used to be here and uh, when the camp first opened people were living on uh, half a litre of soup and a little piece of bread uh, a day. The soup would basically be boiled water with um, potato peelings and as the uh, camp expanded and the numbers increased then that was uh, halved. So many people died of uh, starvation. And this area here used to be the, um, the prisoners' kitchen and uh, baths. The baths in particular um, hold many bad memories for the uh, survivors because they were the uh, site of humiliating admission procedures. And this is where uh, roll call would take place every morning. Thousands of prisoners would have to stand here and wait until their number was called out. They no longer were referred to by their name, but by a number. So this was the uh, main camp street, which ran through the centre of the compound. And you can see um, the kind of pits where the barracks used to be on either side. And just here, this was the first sick bay. So prisoners that were sick would be uh, sent to uh, stay in this barrack and um, many people uh, wanted to be sent there because it meant it got them out of uh, work but at the same time if they were deemed to be too sick then uh, they risked being murdered. Towards the end of the uh, camp's existence over a fifth of all the barracks in the compound had become sick base. The barracks that were here um, would have been for uh, the prisoners who worked uh, who worked for the SS, and um, so they were given special privileges. They had uh, linen, and um, they were had uh, better treatment than everyone else. The main reason being that the SS, um, because they had to work with uh, these inmates, didn't want them to get sick, so they got preferential treatment. And just here, there would be more of the um, barracks that were converted into sick bays as um, illnesses such as uh, typhoid fever, diphtheria, tuberculosis and scabies started to run rampant in the camp. More and more people were becoming sick and so more of the barracks became uh, sick bays. So this was the, known as the Juden block, which was the um, old um, Jewish women were housed in uh, these barracks. But they became quickly became uh, just a, a, another barrack as all the Jews had been sent to the uh, gas chambers. And this uh, was the uh, tuberculosis block. And one section of the room here, um, what the SS used to refer to as the idiot's room. And so uh, people who um, were struggling mentally to cope with life inside the camp would be sent to the idiot's room. Um, in the tuberculosis block and uh, pretty much everyone who was sent to that block were not long after sent to the gas chambers. So towards the uh, rear of the camp this is where all the kind of workshops used to be where the uh, prisoners were forced into slave labour. Um, there used to be a building there which was um, a textile factory and uh, where uh, Prisoners used to make uniforms, SS uniforms, prisoners uniforms. And over here is the uh, mechanical workshops, which uh, has undergone some uh, modification since uh, the Soviet army took over this place after the uh, end of World War II. So you can see this uh, aerial shot of uh, Furtenberg, which is uh, where I began my day, which is a, a lovely little town. I sat down here somewhere and had a coffee, looking at the church. This huge lake here, and the camp's just over here, somewhere.
it really is quite an experience uh, when you visit places like this. I have visited um, other camps before, uh, Sachsenhausen, Terrazen, Mauthausen, um, Auschwitz and one in Riga and um, I'm sure there are others and you know a lot of the information about the camps are very similar you know people went through very similar experiences and the terror that what they must have gone through every second is just unimaginable you know and then people were sent to these places to be either worked to death or shot um, in mass killings and dumped in mass graves or sent to the gas chambers and then burned and their only crime was uh, they didn't fit in with the uh, Nazis ideologies they were Jewish or gypsies or homosexuals or opponents uh, to the regime This is where it leads. And of course, you get the people a bit there. Uh, I put them in the, uh, the corona lot, the people who are denying that corona exists. I put them in the same people as Holocaust deniers because you can't, they're so far down the rabbit hole, they, you can't save them. They have to save themselves. I mean, how can you deny that something exists where the evidence is not only here, but in various other places all across Europe. Lots of these camps are still still here to act as a reminder, a lesson from history. So on this side, this would be where the uh, uh, men's camp used to be. Because Ravenscroft did also have uh, a men's camp um, they were separated, uh, there was the women's camp and the men's camp and um, the men's camp uh, was uh, to uh, provide slave labour uh, to build more um, satellite camps as, the, uh, uh, as Ravenscroft uh, expanded. Around 20,000 men were sent to Ravenscroft. Despite increasing the uh, capacity of the concentration camp, they still couldn't keep up with the uh, numbers of new arrivals. And so it was decided that they would erect a huge tent on this spot here. And uh, this tent would uh, hold 4,000 people, mainly new arrivals from other concentration camps, including Auschwitz. And one of the new arrivals was Corrie Ten Boom, who um, was the daughter of a watchmaker in Harlem near Amsterdam in uh, the Netherlands and uh, she was arrested for hiding Jews uh, in the uh, house of the shop and she ended up here and she arrived tired, weak, hungry and was sent into this tent and she was stood with all the other people that she'd uh, arrived with waiting to be told what would happen next and after hours and hours of waiting uh, they came to realise that nothing was going to happen next, this was where they were being put. They didn't have a room, they didn't have anywhere to sleep, they had no food and they had to try and sleep standing up because uh, the floor, which was just like uh, straw, was uh, just soggy because the toilets had overflowed into the tent. So there was a lot of disease and the SS wouldn't come in the tent. So no food, nowhere to sleep, tired, hungry. And yet, even in that situation, there was comfort to be found because if the SS weren't coming in, then they weren't coming in to send them to work or to send them, you know, to be sent to the gas chambers. 4,000 people in an area this size. So this um, memorial area has been set up in response to uh, requests from organisations um, and individuals um, to be able to pay their respects to either groups of people or individuals. So I'm outside the uh, 
camp now, outside the camp walls and uh, listed on these walls are all the name, uh, names of the countries uh, from which uh, people were sent, the citizens of these countries. Soviet Union, Romania, Poland, it's got a lot of uh, flowers and flags and things on the Polish one. More people from Poland died here than any other country. So this is now um, a burial ground. This was uh, for all the people that were discovered buried in mass graves in uh, various other locations have been reburied in this uh, burial ground with the Garden of Roses and the um, wall of all the countries, the memorial wall. And this is where the gas chamber used to be. Between uh, five and six thousand people were sent to a gas chamber right here. Initially, the people that died in the camp were cremated in the uh, town. In 1943, the SS had this crematorium built. As the numbers were rising significantly. So this commemorates the uh, mass shootings that took place here. So uh, you had the gas chambers at the other side, you've got the crematorium here and this is where the mass shootings used to take place and um, where the women were executed with a gunshot to the back of the neck. When I was stood at the site where the uh, huge tent used to be, I read uh, the story of uh, a young woman who um, was born in Budapest to Slovakian parents and her father uh, was called up by the Nazis first and he was taken away and then she received her letters and she had to get on a train, she had no idea where she was going. Um, she just knew she was going to a concentration camp. And she talks of um, when she arrived at uh, Furstenberg and how she felt that she'd been lucky because it just looked beautiful. The town, the lakes, even the swans. Not long after that, the reality of her situation uh, set in as she was sent straight to the tent um, where she was basically just left for three days. No food, nowhere to sleep. And hers is one of many thousands of people's stories. Thousands of people came through Ravensbrück concentration camp which is one of thousands of concentration camps across Europe it almost makes it worse to think that all of the the terror that's going on in there and just at the other side of the wall which is obviously too high so they wouldn't have been able to see it is this and this was um, a popular um, tourist town then So I think this is a good place to end this vlog. On one side, we have memories of a past that's just incomprehensible. Just the terror that took place behind that wall. Thousands of deaths. Unbelievable suffering. And on the other side, peace, tranquility, calmness. If you do come to Berlin and you are interested in um, the Holocaust and, and that uh, period of history, then get on the train. It's, it's 10 euros here, 10 euros back. 
Come to the town, the town's lovely. Come to the camp, it's an incredible experience. I have been to many camps before, but I'm, I'm quite, this one's, I'm quite blown away by this one. It's uh, moving quite a bit, to be honest. You just try and remember that no matter how awful life can be, how terrible people can be, it can also be beautiful.